Welcome back to the couch, you amazing, twisted mother lovers. I pile myself with research every week to bring you the most ultimate twisted story I possibly can. And remember, everything I cover is based on true events. So go ahead and pull that twisted couch up and invite your friends back over because it is time for me to again take you on another twisted journey into the unknown in today's episode of Twisted Couch Talk. Welcome back to the couch, you guys. Ah, I missed you. Did you miss me? I know I missed you guys. And it is Friday, and you know. You know what that means. It's time for me to take you guys on God knows what kind of journey. But first, I hope you guys had a Merry Christmas. I know me and my family did. We had a fun time opening presents and making cookies. It was just, it was just so fun. I hope you guys had a fantastic Christmas, uh, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. Or maybe you were just celebrating the Chinese New Year. Hey, cool. Whatever. I hope you guys had a very safe, fun time. And uh, I look forward to hearing your guys' stories for whatever happened on Christmas. I'm sure you guys are going to hit me up. But uh, speaking of which, thank you guys for tuning into this episode. All right, pat yourself on the back. You've made it to, oh, geez, what episode am I on? Five? The fifth episode? I think this is the fifth episode. You've made it this far, you beautiful, twisted mother lover. So, all right, thank you so much for coming back and keep coming back and talking to me and listening to the episodes and just giving me feedback and it's oh, it's so amazing. It really is mind blowing to see how many people are listening and just people getting a hold of me, giving me ideas. You guys literally motivate me to do this. At first, I was really skeptical. I didn't know if it was going to be successful or or anything. I had no idea how it was going to turn out. But you guys non-stop hit me up and talk to me and it's just it motivates me to want to dive deeper do a better job and just give you an amazing twisted story every single week so so yeah i can't thank you guys enough and just keep spreading that sick twist also don't forget to join the facebook page twisted couch talk has a facebook page go over there get to that follow button you pick up your axe over your head you come down as hard as you can but and then you, you lightly tap the follow button. You don't want to break it because you gotta be able to follow it. Tap, tap that follow button. Lastly, real quick, Patreon, Patreon. If you guys want to subscribe to me and kind of donate to the show, help out so I can upgrade my equipment, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But enough of the business crap. It's Friday, and you guys know why you came over here and sat on the couch. You came here for a beautiful twisted story. And I have one question. What did you guys think of that EVP? God, that's crazy, isn't it? I'm telling you, that is just... Ugh, give me chills. It gave me chills. Whew. Like before I started recording this episode, I had to pray. Because we're jumping back into the paranormal. So, do you believe in the paranormal? I genuinely want to know. Because you know now, I, I do. I mean, I have a pretty strong faith in the paranormal. I believe that shit's real now. Um... Or have you seen a ghost? Have you ever seen anything move across the table? Or anything like that? But most of all, have you guys ever heard about a ghost that was so badass it could solve crime? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to jump into this story and a ghost solves an amazing crime. You're going to love it. What crime, you might ask? Well, let's go ahead and dive in and find out what really happened to the Greenbrier ghost. Okay, really quick. Sorry if there was a little bit of background noise a few minutes ago. Um, My heater kicked on, and I didn't realize it was making all that noise in the background, so I apologize. Also, uh, the EVP I was referring to was the Christmas special, episode 4, I believe, Krampus. Go check it out. It's good. You'll love it. Go check out episode 4. You'll know what I'm talking about. Now, enough of the bullcrap. The Greenbrier Ghost. The real reason why you guys came here and sat on the couch. Let's go ahead and talk about her. Okay, so the Greenbrier ghost is the name popularly given to the alleged ghost of Elva Zona Hester Shue. She was born sometime in 1873 in Greenbrier County in West Virginia. 
Her loving parents were Jacob H. Hester and Mary Jane Hester. They were both born in Virginia. Um, and you know with a name like Jane, they toked on the devil's lettuce every single day. No, okay, no, they didn't. It's too early for that, Brandon. We're not doing that right now. Let's just go on with the story. She grew up in a small farming community, and other than that, there's really not much else to say. And I mean, honestly, thank God. Uh, okay, so we've been covering a lot of stories, and every single one starts with like rape, and, and it's just horrible things that's happening, and there's none of that. She actually has a really good upbringing. Thank goodness. So, she was also well known as um, a very well mannered young lady uh, who always uh, who always curtsied as you walked by, uh, very courteous to others, and was just a pure spirit. But by the age of seven, she did have some brothers, one older brother and two younger brothers, and their names were Alfred, John, and Lewis. And and they may have given her a rough time, you know, as brothers do, because you grow up with brothers, you're gonna you're gonna catch some crap. But she did have a great upbringing, nonetheless. But after schooling, she did struggle in life while having a baby at the age of 22. And she did have this baby out of wedlock. The information about the father, there really isn't any. And I don't know if that's because he either wasn't, you know, wasn't involved in the child's life or if she left him or he left her or maybe he could have died even. I mean, it is, you know, late 1800s. People died from random crap all the time. So uh, there is nothing on record really about the father. So he wasn't in the child's upbringing. Um, But in October of 1896, Elva Zona Hester, and she also did go by her middle name, Zona. So from here on out, I'm going to refer to her as Zona. And mainly because I think that's such a beautiful name. All my kids' names starts with Z's. And Zona, I I like that one. Maybe, you know, for uh, number seven, I can name that one Zona. Okay, so she had met a blacksmith named Edward Stribling Trout Shoe. Yeah, what the hell kind of name is that? Every time I think of the word trout, like being in somebody's name, I think of that dude, Trout Walker, off of Holes. And have you ever seen his lips? Get on there, look up Trout Walker, Holes. That man has got chicken lips, okay? He has no upper lip at all. So now every time you hear the word trout, you're going to think of, a, of a, you know an ugly man. With no upper lip, and it looks like really weird. Look at him smile. Watch a video of him. It's it's creepy. Come on, girl. No one ever says no to Trout Walker. Come on, if you know holes, you know that you know that quote. Okay, so Trout Walker. No, <laughs> not Trout Walker. Edward Shoe. Okay, Edward Shoe. He was a floater who worked here and there and never really settled down. Uh, but he was married prior and. They never really settled down. They traveled a lot and, you know, was here and there. But along these travels, his wife had died. And when he was questioned about it, he had just said that, you know, they went horseback riding and she fell off and hit her head on a rock. Wow, that must have really sucked back then because that was literally the only way that you could travel was by horse or carriage. So traveling was honestly pretty dangerous and you didn't have, you know, heaters in your cars back then. Well, it wouldn't have been a car, your cart. Your carriage wouldn't have had a heater back then. Oh, just, I'd fuck that. That would have sucked so bad. Oh, I couldn't imagine traveling back then. He had also lived in Austria, West Virginia. He went to Greenbrier in search of a new life. And he was actually doing really good for himself because he was a blacksmith. And blacksmith, if you were a blacksmith back then, yo, you was bringing in the cheddar. You was making money because everything was around a blacksmith mainly back then because all the battles and it's just everything that was, was going on in the 1800s. So being a blacksmith, it's like working in, it's like working in aircraft. It's big bucks. And since he was doing so good as a blacksmith, he wanted to really just settle down and get a house and just have a family. He had worked at a shop called James Crookshanks. The place was called James Crookshanks. Yeah, okay. So I read, I did read that right. That literally sounds like if you're a crook, you should stay the hell away from there because he's going to shank you in your rib cage and possibly your butt cheek. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. Ask Sagawa. Ask Sagawa why. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Also, he was 35 years old when he had met Zona. And I'm telling you, God, that is a pretty name. I love that name. I, I really do. I'm probably going to end up using that. I really like that. Zona had met him while he was working as a blacksmith. So she had went into their store to, I don't know, maybe buy a shield or a sword or something. But her and her family, they went into the blacksmith to get whatever they need. And as soon as she walked in the door, they had looked at each other and they locked eyes. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. That deep, deep look when you over here raise your eyebrows and you're just like, "Mm mm-hmm. She looked back at him with lost in her eyes. And he looks back at her with a warm, welcoming smile as if he wants her to know that everything's going to be all right. So she goes home and she can't get him out of her mind. She knew exactly what she had to do. She had to go back there first thing in the morning without her family so she can profess her love to him. That's actually really sweet. That's some Disney shit right there. I love that. Um, So she goes back a second time to go profess her love. She walks in and notices him standing behind the anvil. And she walks up to him with a smile. He looks at her and says, Evening, ma'am. What can I help you all with? Slow jazz starts to play. She says, I hope you're a strong blacksmith who knows his way around a hammer. As he shrugs and puts his hammer down, goes around the anvil, he takes her by the hand and says, Darling, they don't call me Thor for nothing. And he immediately kissed her with so much passion. And she had been longing for it for so long. And he starts to rip off her dress. Wait, no, 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 that didn't happen. But how many of you pervs out there are picturing that right now? And was it sexy? As long as it was, that's all I need to know. Because now I know I could put together a sexy scene. But anyways, no, that doesn't happen. But she does go in there and tell him how she feels. He feels the same. And they immediately got together. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. And they became inseparable. They were together for about three months and decided that timing was right. And this is exactly what they needed to do. And they went and got married. But... Mary, Zona's mother, had always hated him and didn't trust him. She had thought that he was nothing but a con man. So they go on to buy a house together and they seemed just so in love with each other and and they became inseparable. She would make him lunch, whether it was soup or squirrel, I'm, I'm not sure. I would love to try some squirrel. I've had, I've had shark, I've had gator, but not squirrel. I need to have me some damn squirrel. They even had a neighbor boy who was 11 years old, came over and helped with chores, being rewarded with sweets, lunch, and and even dinner, and loved going over there. It felt like he was really at home. But Zona never really liked to travel, and she just really enjoyed being a stay-at-home wife, taking care of the house, cooking meals, and just loving and taking care of her husband. It seems like a perfect little family that's just doing so well in life. And there is just so much love surrounding the family and the home. But that would come to an immediate end on January 23rd, 1897. One January afternoon in 1897, Edward would ask the neighbor boy to see if Elva needed anything from the market. Explaining that he was behind on forming daggers and swords. And let me just take a second. How how badass of a job is it to be a blacksmith and just and just holding the sword and swinging the hammer and forming these amazing things? I have seen so much badass shit made from a blacksmith. Oh, it's so cool. There's a TV show about it and everything. Check it out. It is so cool. I would make all kinds of amazing crap. But anyways, the boy tells him with excitement, Of course, sir. I'll go and see if she needs anything. And he, and he takes off running. And the Willy Wonka theme song started playing as he ran, jumping over sewer drains and jumping on top of homeless people, running back and forth through the streets yelling, I'm Rick James, bitch! Oh, okay, no, that... Okay, so it may not have happened just like that, but he did run through the streets and he may or may not have been yelling, I'm Rick James, bitch. That might... But these facts are unknown, but, you know, it's he said, she said, it may it may have happened. He makes it to their log house ready to get the list of things to get from the market. What he will come across is horrifying. He comes home and sees Zona's lifeless body at the bottom of their stairway. He found her lifeless body, and she was on her back with a wide-eyed, horrified stare looking back at him. One of her hands was on her chest over her heart and the other was on the floor next to her side and her feet were resting close together and her head was tilted to the side just a little bit he's staring down at her and recomposes himself and shakes his head and said ma'am are you okay ma'am there was no response so he frantically took off running home to tell his mother what he found saying i'm rick james bitch his mother immediately slaps him across the face But, of course, that didn't happen. What really happened was saying he thought maybe she fell down the stairs. The horrified mother immediately notifies the police and local doctor. Now, remember, 
Back then, you traveled by horse and carriage, and you're not going 80 on the interstate, so it took a long time to travel. God, I would... I'm telling you, I hate traveling as it is. I drive an hour to work and an hour home every day, and I hate it. I couldn't imagine traveling to work on a horse. I'm done. And it took him about an hour to get there, and he, give or take, lived about 15 miles away. 20-minute drive. Ugh, that would suck. Excuse me, I need to get a drink. But by the time that he got there, her husband had already heard of what happened and rushed home frantically to that sweet soundtrack of Willy Wonka. But as he jumped over the homeless man, he smashed his face on the curb and busted out all of his teeth. He started to seize out and dies. Okay. (laughs) Okay. That didn't happen, but he did rush home nonetheless. He had went home and picked her up, and he had prepared her body for the burial by bathing her and dressing her in a high neck dress with a stiff collar and placed a veil over her face and laid her on their bed. When asked why he did all that, he wanted to make sure that he fulfilled her request of being buried in that dress. But I guess somebody would do that if that's how they dealt with, you know, a loved one passing away. You know, everyone grieves differently, so you never know, and it wasn't against the law or anything, so who knows? So when the doctor showed up after an hour of travel, he goes up to the door and knocks on it. Edward Shue answers the door with tears in his eyes. They nod their heads at each other, and Edward then leads him upstairs upstairs to the bedroom, and the doc had noticed she was already prepped and lied down. He eyes Edward, but thinks nothing of it, and continues to inspect her. When he started, everything seemed okay and routine, but... He starts getting closer to her face and neck, and Edward would start to cry more and more hysterically. And when the doctor grabbed the dress's collar, Edward then picked up his wife's head and cradles it and and began sobbing uncontrollably. So due to this, the doc didn't want to upset him anymore and make it any harder than it already was. And he just chopped it up to that he was just a grieving husband and left him alone and reported that she had just suffered from a sudden heart attack. He found nothing amiss with the body parts that he examined, He had also been treating Zona for a few weeks prior, so he listed the cause of death as everlasting fate. And then it changed to complications from pregnancy. And back then, people died from pregnancy pretty regularly, and that's that's sad, but because it wasn't uncommon for women to, to pass due to pregnancy complications during these times because, remember, modern medicine was cutting limbs off and a large jog of that fire water. Yes, Papa's Cough Medicine was the only way to cure anything. And I, they really believed that. Alcohol and cutting off limbs. So you can only imagine, yeah, people did die from pregnancy quite frequently. So Zora's mother was devastated. When she heard the news, she had nothing but pure hatred on her face. And she said, the devil has killed her. She looked like she already knew what had happened. Her mother goes on to say she had never liked Edward. And even without evidence, she was convinced that he had murdered her daughter. Twisted couch talk rule number three. Don't marry after three weeks. Don't jump into marriage. Obviously, it doesn't work. People are dying left and right or getting beaten with canes and and crazy crap happens. Take the time. Get to know who you're dealing with, like I say all the time. Get to know who you're dealing with. Twisted Couch Talk rule number three. Don't jump into marriage. Now, the funeral was the next day and Zona was placed in an She was placed in a coffin that wasn't even finished. And she was taken by horse carriage and was taken to her parents' house. And it was a 15-mile carriage ride. But Edward walked behind her with a lantern close to her head, staying close and sobbing. To others, he just seemed like a grieving husband who lost his wife. I mean, if I lost my wife, I honestly don't know what I would do or how I would react. She was laid out at her parents' house. For the townspeople to come and and pay their respects, the viewing continued all day send Saturday into Monday morning. So, all weekend into Monday morning, and her burial was that Monday morning. That morning, Edwards paced by the casket, fiddling with Zona's head and neck and adjusting the collar and the veil. He ended up covering her neck with a scarf. He would also just show waves of emotion going back and forth from a grieving husband and just going crazy with panicked emotions. He also wouldn't let anybody 
get close, kind of like a lion protecting his food. So was I, I wonder if he was like anybody who walked up close to the casket, he just like looked over back his shoulder, kind of like the kind of like when a dog is pooping and he looks back over his shoulder at his owner, but more like like a snarl. Her mother ends up walking to her coffin and had taken a sheet from it, kind of as a piece of her daughter so she can have it forever. So her mother walks up to her coffin and had taken a sheet from it to just have a piece of her daughter to keep. And that that's just so sad and horrible. You know, we're supposed to outlive our kids. They're supposed to bury us, not us bury them. I couldn't imagine ever having to bury one of my children. That would just, it would tear me apart. She did actually try to give it to Edward, thinking, you know, he may want it, but he did nothing but refuse it. So she took it back home and realized that it had an odd odor, and she decided to wash it, place it in the wash with some water and soap, and let it soak. And when she came back, you're not going to believe what she saw. The water was blood red. Fuck that. I would take off running down the streets, and I would never come back. She took it out, and it was stained pink. She then boiled the sheet, hung it out to dry, and it was still pink. Ugh, so many chills just now. So many chills. Ugh. So from that experience, she came, she came to the conclusion that her daughter had to have been murdered. She continued to pray to God and her daughter for answers. And if only Zona could just tell her what happened, she thought. And you're not going to believe what happened and how this story unfolds because it's just so unbelievable. She prays every night for four nights. Her daughter came to her in a dream and told her what happened. Yeah. Her daughter comes to her four times, four nights in a row and tells her the same thing each time. Every night she appeared different. The first night she came as kind of like a white orb of light and over the four and over the four nights she would manifest into her daughter a little more and more zona's ghost had confessed to her mother that that edward was really cruel and had been abusive and that night had attacked her in a fit of rage because she didn't make any meat for dinner when he came home what an ungrateful piece of shit. She brings you lunch. She makes you dinner all the time. The one day you come home and there ain't dinner ready, you gotta rough her up. What a piece of crap. God. So the ghost of Zona goes on to say he had broken her neck. And the ghost told her this as she spun her head around. Ugh. Ugh. I just thought of the movie Casper. Have you guys seen Casper? Okay, well, if you haven't, let me go ahead and explain a little bit of what I'm talking about. You know, the part when the priest comes over, I, I believe he's a priest, but the priest comes over, he's got a little, he's got a type of brimmed cowboy type hat, and they call him over to exercise this mansion that they have. He goes inside, he's maybe in there for five minutes, comes back out, and when he comes out the front door, you see his torso and his body looks normal, but his head is turned all the way completely around. Ah! <sighs> ah! <sighs> That's just, yeah, that's that's all, that's just, ah, it's so creepy. Ah, so creepy. That's what that made me think of. Then the ghost would turn and walk away, disappearing into the night while while staring back at her mother. Whew, I just pictured that. Oh, my God, so many chills. Okay, okay, imagine somebody manifests themselves in front of you, whether you're dreaming or awake, and they just turn their body away and their face just stares at you but their body keeps turning and then they walk away while there's okay yeah I, that that gave me chills Whew. i literally have goosebumps wow Whew. is it cold in here or is it just okay you guys got to remember it's dark it's quiet and i'm alone in my house that's that's how i record these Whew. and it's creepy it's just ah uh, it's creepy so her mother ended up going to the local prosecutor, John, John Preston, and spent the afternoon at his office trying to convince him to reopen the case by telling her the story of her daughter coming to her in this dream and telling him what she had told her. But as she's telling the story, he doesn't just brush it off, kind of like what normal people would do and just 
kind of shoo him out the door. He actually sits there and listens. He does actually just sit there and listen and, and hears her out and gives her compliments of sorrow and concern. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I just, oh, I was eating some hot chicken earlier. It came back up. Oh, give me a minute. <clears throat> God, that burned so bad. Oh, I don't even know where I'm at. Whew, I've never experienced anything that, like that in my life. That, that was horrible. God, that was horrible. Okay, and so, yeah, he hears her out. Now, whether he believed her story or not about the ghost, that doesn't really matter, does it? Because of her constant badgering and telling him, hey, let's do this. We need to do this. Let's check into it. Let's investigate. And came to him with a convincing enough story and so that was enough that was enough for him to be like all right and he goes off and starts asking questions around town he would go on to ask knapp the doctor slash coroner and ask him what his findings were uh the doctor the doctor would say that it he wasn't able to finish the inspection due to edward being so emotional and just being in the way now i want you to just Really hear me and understand what I'm going to say. Because due to this apparition appearing in her mother's dreams and telling her what happened, just because of that, they reopen the case and they investigate to see if this really happened or not. So he proceeds to tell the doctor the story of what her mother had told him. The doctor is completely baffled. And he said, we got to go find out right now. And so that was enough. So that was enough evidence for Preston to justifiably have a warrant in order for a complete autopsy of the body. And a few days later, and the body was exhumed, despite everything Edward said, he was like, leave her alone, just let her rest. And he was just getting really frustrated and really, really mad and didn't approve of them digging her up. But as he's saying this to the cops, the cops basically told him, If you're not there while we dig her up, we're going to make you be there. So he was going to be there either way. And I love that attitude, cops. This time you didn't fail me. I've read so many stories where the cops are just morons. And they, yeah, yeah. Listen to Sagawa. Listen to Sagawa. You'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, the cops come through and make him be there. And he goes ahead to say, I know I'm going to be arrested, but they won't be able to prove it. What? Wait, what? Is that a little bit of a confirmation? Why would he say that? Okay, what an idiot. But anyways, there were a lot of news articles released at this time. One stating that her mother wasn't the only one thinking that that foul play was involved. As, As a matter of fact, most of the entire town was thinking that as well. There's no way that she just fell down the stairs and died. So the coroner... And two other doctors laid the body out in the town's one-room schoolhouse to give, to give that body, to give the body a thorough investigation. On February twenty-second, eighteen ninety-seven, in the local one-room schoolhouse, the the autopsy lasted three hours long, and they found out that Zona's neck had in fact not been broken, and it was just a huge huge misunderstanding fuck i i mean i guess ghosts aren't real you guys and uh uh the episode's over uh thank you guys for listening no that's a damn lie you're not gonna believe what the hell they find out okay her neck her neck was in fact broken in two different places wow okay Okay, so so far this apparition is right. And according to the report published on March 9th, 1897, the discovery was made that the neck was in fact broken and the windpipe was mashed in. So what does that tell you guys? A little bit of strangulation? Because it takes a lot, a lot of force to mash a windpipe. On the throat, there were finger marks indicating that she had been choked. Ha-ha, I called it. I called it. The neck, the neck, uh, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. The neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae. So I'm assuming that could be one dislocation or fracture, or I don't know if it's two separate plates that were, in fact, if it were two plates, that's a lot more force, but still, one plate, it takes a lot of force 
to break somebody's neck. And the ligaments were torn and ruptured in her neck. Her windpipe had been crushed to the point and her windpipe had been crushed in. So let me just tell you what I think. I think he choked her at the top of the stairs. They were, you know, okay. So I think what happened was he got home from work and he went upstairs and uh, went to go, you know, see his wife. And he's like, hey, darling, how's the, how's the mead coming? I need some of that mead. I need some of that sweet meat. And uh, she goes, oh, oh, honey, I'm ever so sorry. I just, I put the wash on and I just haven't made it. To, I haven't had the time to make meat. And he immediately chokes the living shit out of her saying, just, just like, going in a fit of rage at the top of the stairs and she passes out and falls down the stairs. And after he calmed down and realized what he had done, he went down there and just fucking snapped her neck. I think that's what really happened. I mean, to choke somebody and snap their neck and them to fall down and all and all that, that's, that's really a lot to happen. So if you think about it, if it did in fact go down the way that I just explained it, think about it. That's extreme premeditation on a really big level because I'm not saying it's okay. But let's say he does get mad and he chokes her at the top of the stairs and she falls down. You know what? I messed up. I messed up big time and I need help. I'm going to go, I call, you know, get help. Police, they come and you get some mental help, whatever, and you fix the situation. But no, he chooses not to and goes down to the bottom of the snares, the stairs and just snaps her neck. That's what I think happened and how it unfolded. You guys you guys have kind of what you know the story is, but that's what I ultimately think really happened after I read the story. But uh, the cops told Edward that her neck was indeed broken and all he did was drop his head and said, you can't prove shit. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Why would you drop your head then, punk? Man, sorry. I just, I don't like this guy at all. At all. He's a punk. He's a... (sighs) Yeah. So, he was immediately arrested. He was immediately arrested and, and, and thrown in a stone jail cell with bars all around like a caged animal. That's what he is. He's a freaking monster. And you know, I don't mean to get so, so touchy, but like, when you think about it, and if you get murdered, what are your last thoughts? You know, honestly, she was probably just expecting her home. She was probably just expecting her husband to come home, be loving and, you know, come say hi and just be happy to see her. But instead starts to choke her out. What do you think she was thinking in that moment? What was I thinking? Why would I do this? Why am I here? That's got to be the most scariest thing. Because, I don't know, in the end, all you would really want is your parents because who, who else would you cry out for? Who else would come save you? That's, I just wanted to bring you back to that reality of it because that's how serious that shit is. God, that's got to be horrifying. It's got to be so scary to just the moments before you die. Those are your last thoughts. Ugh, didn't mean to bring the house down, but God, this dude is a fucking monster. So when his trial, be, when his trial began... The cops had be- had begun to bring up his past in the trials, such as what they found. He had been, a- and they found he had been arrested multiple times for stealing horses and also violent type crimes. And his ex-wife had also stated at some point while she was still alive that he was a very abusive husband. And that's also when they had found out she was dead. Is when they investigated. So bringing all this evidence back, they dug up the body, they got the broken, they just, this poor woman's neck is just crushed in. It's, they have all the evidence there. So even though the ghost story sounds far-fetched and everything, it's still lining up exactly right. So what do you think? Do you think this is a true story and her daughter did come to her? I mean, I think so. I mean, look at the evidence. There's just so many things that's saying, yes, this is really true. He goes on to plead not guilty. Her mother had been her mother had been the prosecutor's star witness, but Press wanted to avoid the issue of, of her ghostly sightings because her mother's story might be objected to the hearsay by the defense. 
but basically that's saying that's just he said she said blah 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 and they can't use it perhaps I don't know because Edward's lawyer pressures these questions and her mom extensively explained what happened and the ghost visits and she she wasn't ashamed she wasn't ashamed and I don't know if they were expecting it but that tactic that tactic ended up backfiring and it favored in the mother's defense wow isn't that crazy it favored the mother many people in the community if not the jury seemed to believe her mother's story And Edward did himself no favors by taking the stand on his own defense, rambling and pleading to the jury to, quote, to look at my face and say that he's not guilty. I'm not going to lie, but if I was on the jury, I would have stood up, got off the stand, not the stand, but got off the jury bench, walked down over there, got in his face, slapped him as hard as I fucking could, and been like, you are guilty, you piece of crap. That's what I would have done if I was a jury. Good thing I'm not on it. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd probably end up. So after he tells the jury to look at him in the face and call him guilty, it only took them 10 minutes before returning with a verdict. The jury comes back and they sit down. The judge says, have you guys reached a verdict? A gentleman stands up and says, yes, your honor. We have reached the verdict that Edward is guilty of first degree murder. And... And we suggest a life sentence. Now, the jury at first wanted to put him to death, but they couldn't because it had to be a unanimous vote. And it was only 7 to 10. So, damn it, I wish he would have got lynched and hung high. Edward was sentenced to life in prison, and the people of the village were outraged. And so, and they gathered 150 fellow citizens and gathered ropes, torches, pitchforks and quickly turned into a lynching mob and they wanted to lynch him for his for his crime they get there and the sheriff had they get there and the sheriff had no option but to open the cell they pull him out and then as they're taking as they're taking him out to the tree where they're going to hang him the word got out and other law enforcement showed up and broke up the mob leading to a lot of people actually getting arrested but the charges got dropped and they didn't have to do any sentencing and they didn't have to serve any time. But see, I was honestly hoping whenever I was reading that and the anticipation and the buildup of them going and bringing a, the mob, bringing a lynching mob and everything, I was like, yes, this motherfucker is going to get hung. And then they stopped it. But I do have some good news. He did soon die after an epidemic tore through the prison in the spring of 1900. It was unclear what exactly did kill him, but it could have been from the measles or any other kind of plague that that was spreading around in that era. There also were no records on where he was buried, but they were burning bodies and stuff like that during the plague to stop the spread of the outbreak, so maybe they burned his body. So nobody ever really saw her ghost again, except her mother. She claims that she sees her daughter every single night. And actually, what a what a what an amazing twisted way to have a happy ending. I mean, yes, she got mur- yes, she got murdered and that's that's horrible. Absolutely horrible, but I mean, at least her mother gets to see her every single night and it's that's you know what? That's actually kind of comforting, you know. Her mother gets to live the rest of her days and see her daughter every night. That's awesome. Now, and this is true, on Zona's tombstone, it says, Folk figure, known as the Greenbrier Ghost, her death in 1897 was presumed natural until her spirit appeared to her mother to describe how she was killed by her husband, Edward. Autopsy on the exhumed body verified the apparition's account saying that Edward did in fact kill her by by breaking her neck and was found guilty of murder. This is the only known case in which testimony from a ghost helped convict a murder. So you guys tell me what you believe. So what do you guys believe? Was this just a horrible accident where she fell down some stairs? Or did this ruthless bastard get mad over dinner, not being ready, and attacked her out of pure hatred and rage? No matter what you think, 
Just remember, no matter who saw or believed what happened, without her coming as a ghost to her mother and telling her story of what happened, her mother may have never gone to the police to report it, and that piece of shit of human garbage may have never gone to trial, and would have gotten away with this and never been held accountable, and would have gotten away with this horrible crime and never would have been solved. Okay, so let's have a nice long sip of that twisted tea and jump in today's top five twisted recap. Number one, as a child, she honestly did have a good upbringing with loving parents and loving brothers other than your typical fighting amongst among siblings. But nonetheless, she would have a great childhood and everybody adored her. Number two, she had met her husband in a blacksmith shop and they really did lock eyes and it was history from there. She would go back the next morning to profess her love and they became inseparable. Number three, and that would have given me so many chills if I would have walked up on a dead person and they were staring back up at me. I would have been haunted for the rest of my days. Number four, due to the ghost story, they dug up her, they dug up her remains and realized her neck was broken and her windpipe was torn and crushed in. <sighs> this woman was definitely, indeed, horrifically murdered. Number five, all because her ghost came to her mother and told her what happened. They were able to, they were able to put that piece of shit behind bars where he was hopefully coughing and choking on his mucus due to the plague that swept the area. Yeah, and I hope he was raped in the booty hole with a long, big black dick by the man named Bubba. And I think we all know who Bubba is. And I think we can all equally agree that Bubba can have his way with him because of all of his twisted, dark deeds that he had done. Okay, but enough about Bubba. Let's go on ahead and dive in to this week's Florida Man. We have a new segment called Florida Man. And what I'm going to do is, I do it live, I'll get on Google, and I'm going to Google Florida Man right now, google.com, Florida Man, and then you you type in the day that you're listening, but a year before. So like today is 12-30-21, you would do 12-30-2020. First one that pops up, oh God, let's see what happens. All right, this is the first time I'm reading it. I'm seeing this for the first time, just like you guys. A Florida man was arrested Tuesday after stealing all of the chicken wings. <laughs> what? <laughs> Start it over. A Florida man was arrested Tuesday after stealing a lot of chicken wings and other hot food available items at a 7-Eleven. Okay. The sheriff's office was called to the convenience store at around 8.23 p.m. <laughs> after a man put gloves on and took food items from the store and took food items out of their tray and ran out of the store. The clerk said the man who has not yet been identified He's been to the store before. Why would you do this? I know who you are. <laughs> the la- <laughs> Oh my god, he's he's a repeated offender. Oh my god. This is so good. The dude said he knows what he looks like. Anyways, anyways. The last time he ate three <laughs> This is bullshit. There's no way this is real. He said the last time he ate three chicken wings in front of the clerk and then left without paying. <laughs> what? <laughs> he, wa- he walked up. Okay, so typical gas stations, they have that little tray where you can g- walk up, grab your food, and pay for it. He, he walked up there, grabbed it, put it on the counter, and looked at the guy. 
and then slowly opened the box, leaning on the counter, and then pulled out a wing and started eating on it, looking at him in the eyes the entire <laughs> the entire time. That is so ridiculous. And, anyways, the man left the store in a car with two other people. Deputies later, deputies later pulled the vehicle over. All three people were detained. While the man that ate chicken wings in front of the in front of the store clerk was charged with disorderly conduct, and yeah, he he was released and he's free to this day. I didn't expect that. I thought last time I checked a Florida man, he set a woman on fire. So you can never, you, you can't expect what you're going to get from this. But enough of the Florida man. Now it's time for the updates. Okay, just so you know, since you made it to the end of the episode, you are now a member of the Twisted Club. Yes, anybody who makes it to the end of the episode is now a member of the Twisted Club. So embrace it, enjoy it, you Twisted Club member you. But uh, so, uh, if you look down in my description, in every episode, I will post links on where you can find pictures. I can't post pictures on certain social media pages because they're too graphic, too gory, and they're a bunch of pussies, and I can't put it there. So, I did this for you guys, in case you are curious. Go down to the description, and... It's all categorized. It'll tell you what's what, pictures, where I got my research, etc. Go down there. You'll find the pictures of the episode that I found. Um, sneak peek. A New Year's murder found out happened when I drank too much. I am so sorry. That was such a lie. No, there will not be a New Year's episode. And it's not because I didn't try. I promise I did. I did. I looked and believe it or not, go ahead. Look it up. Look up New Year's murder. See what you get. Yeah. Good luck. I couldn't find Jack Diddley that would at least last an hour long. (sighs) But I made you guys a promise and I will make it up to you. So I have a special surprise and store for you beautiful twist heads. All you got to do is go to Facebook and uh, go to the Twisted Couch Talk Facebook page. Click that follow button and you'll know what's going to happen. But yes, I have a surprise in store for you guys. And my God, I promise you it's good. I promise you you'll love it. I'm going to make it up to you guys. Also, I decided that every new country that decides to listen to this podcast i'm gonna find one i'm gonna find one twisted fucked up individual in y'all's country and cover him because believe it or not we're all twisted in some way in some way or another we all are it doesn't matter where you are on the globe we are all twisted and i'm gonna show you guys how twisted everybody all over the world can be We're going to fly on over to Finland and see what twisted stories they have to unravel. I guarantee you, I'm going to find something good. Every time we get a new country, I'm going to cover it. Ah, I'm excited to find out what I'm going to find out in Finland. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but thank you guys. Wow. It hasn't even been a month and I'm over a hundred downloads. And that is all thanks to you guys. Thank you so much. What else can I say? I can get on my knees and suck you off, but God damn it, I can't do any more. Thank you guys so, so much. And keep keep spreading that beautiful twist like you amazing, twisted, beautiful twist heads do. Ah, And I love you all so deeply, all the way down to my loins. And don't forget to give a five-star rating, a thumbs up, like heart whatever it is you guys got to do to get us out there if you got to leave a comment leave one leave one saying bob ross likes to paint at graveyards no he does it he does it but it doesn't matter if you follow the show you know what i'm talking about leave a 
leave any comment you want. It doesn't matter. If you or any of your friends have topics, places, things in mind that are fucking twisted and you want me to cover them, email them to me or message them to me on Facebook. <clears throat> and email in your personal stories, paranormal, you got stalked, whatever it is. You let me know, and I'm going to end up reading it at the end of the episode, or I might even make it a bonus episode. There, there is just so much twisted talk to be had that I can't get a hold of that isn't out on the internet because it's in your brains. Let me suck on your brains a little bit and find out what you're thinking because I want to know, and I want to tell everybody. Feedback. I want to hear from you guys. I really do. Email the podcast at Twisted Couch Talk Productions at gmail.com. Your stories, whatever, whatever. Send everything there. Twisted Couch Talk Productions at gmail.com. You guys know it. You've heard it a million times. But now, you can literally find my podcast everywhere except for that one place i can't get to and it's itunes it's like it's like i'm climbing this tree and there's a banana at the top and i just can't reach it and i keep falling to the bottom but i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it and i keep falling but you don't give up and you get that damn banana and that's what i'm gonna do now you can you can you can literally hear me everywhere else except for youtube as well youtube is to come i just don't I'm just short on time, and I don't have a lot of time to to do everything I need to right now. It's all to come. Make sure that you beautiful twist heads, yeah, all of you sexy beasts out there are spreading the twist. Tell your friends, whoever, because that's how we're going to grow. Patreon, really quick. I'm not even going to go into detail. $3, $20. It ranges from there. There's four tiers, and it describes what kind of twist head you are. Go to patreon.com slash twisted couch talk. Go check it out. There's pictures. There's descriptions. It's amazing. You want to support me? I would love it. And then that would make it to where I can go to video, etc., etc. PayPal is to come. When it's When it drops, I'll let you know. Merch. I got some ideas of mine, guys. I do. I definitely do. Merch. I hear you guys. I hear you guys. And I'm going to give you maybe, maybe just a little taste of what I'm going to release. I have an idea. And if it's dumb, please let me know because I don't want to give you guys merch that you're not going to want. But I have an idea. I think one of the logo type icon things I'm going to have is... Think of like this green looking humanoid creature with a pig nose, bug eyed, five strands of hair, kind of hunched over, big feet, real skinny, running away, got his hands together with a pile of meat dripping with blood, and there's your Sagawa. Yeah, a little bit of a taste of some merch that might be coming your way. All you got to do if you want some merch you got to spread the twist you got to spread that fucking twist like a twister plowing through that goddamn town you got to just spread the twist and that's how you're going to get your merch you want merch do your part i'm doing mine i'm telling you stories but enough of the business bullshit let's go ahead and get back to a sense of reality and put this twisted story to bed now I hope you guys all enjoyed the telling of that beautiful ghost story as much as I did. And I look forward to seeing you guys next Friday back on this beautiful twisted couch that is so comfortable. But for now, for now, quit getting married. Just quit getting married all together, okay? Don't try and hide your wife's murder. And I'll see you guys back on the couch with another twisted topic but as always stay twisted you beautiful sexy twisted mother lovers you